everyone. In this video, I'm going to look at what happens when we place a subsidy on a producer in perfect competition. So actually, I'm going to use a market where we have upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve. Now, it is possible to think about what happens if we have perfectly inelastic or elastic curves. So if the curves were perfectly horizontal or vertical, but in this video, I'm just going to stick to the more general cases of our regular sloped curves. And hopefully I can do a video later on on these more odd cases. In our market without intervention, the price would be P star and the quantity traded would be Q star. Our consumer surplus would be this area here below the demand curve above the price. And our producer surplus would be this area here above the supply curve below the price. If we placed a subsidy on the producers in this market, and let's make it a per unit subsidy so that every time a producer sells some quantity in the market, the producer gets an amount of S dollars or whatever your currency is per unit from the government. This is actually going to affect their supply curve. In particular, our supply curve is going to shift down by exactly the amount of the subsidy S. There is a few ways that we can understand this shift. My preferred way is to understand that our supply curve comes from our marginal cost curve. And if the government gives the producers S dollars per unit, this effectively decreases or lowers the marginal cost of each unit. So the marginal cost curve shifts down by S and as a result, so does the supply curve. Another way to think about it is that the supply curve tells us the minimum price that is needed to incentivize the producer to supply a particular amount of the good. If we subsidize the producer S dollars per unit, this minimum price decreases by exactly the amount of the subsidy, which is S dollars. And again, this is just a shift down of the curve. I think the key to understanding subsidies, and it's very much like taxes, is to understand that once we impose a subsidy, the price that the suppliers or the producers receive is now different to the price that the consumers pay. And actually it's really useful to think about, think about subsidies like this. So our producers and our consumers trade and the consumers pay a price uh, per unit to the producers, and let's call that price PC. That can be the consumer's price. The producers then go and they actually get an additional S dollars per unit that they sell from the government. And this means that the total price that the producers get, let's call that PP, so that's producer's price. It could be PS, supplier's price, producers and suppliers is often used interchangeably. Well, that price that they get per unit is equal to the price that they receive from the customer plus the amount of the subsidy. So I'll put all that information up there and let's now find these prices on our diagram. So we know that as a result of the subsidy, our supply curve has shifted down. The new equilibrium point, which is here, is going to isolate uh, the new amount traded, we'll call that Q prime, and also the price that the customers are going to pay per unit. And we've called this PC. Now we can find the price that the producers get per unit. Now, if you recall, the distance between our old supply curve and our new supply curve is exactly the amount of the subsidy. So if I go to the level of PC and if I draw up until my line hits the old supply curve, note that the level there, and I'll draw across now, that's PC plus S because the vertical distance between S and S with subsidy at any point is equal to S. So that's actually it for our prices and our quantity. We have the price that the producer gets per unit, the price that the consumer pays per unit, and we have the amount that is traded. We do need to do our welfare analysis, and it's a good idea to just start with the government here. So the government has injected some money into this market, the total cost of the subsidy to the government is equal to the amount that is traded, that's Q prime, times by the amount of the subsidy S. Visually, that's actually equal to the area of this rectangle here. And you'll note that the height of the rectangle is S and the length is Q prime. 
This area will become interesting later. Let's now though, go on to think about our consumer surplus. Now our consumers are consuming more than they did before since Q prime is larger than Q star and they're paying less per unit because PC is lower than P star. I'm still taking the whole area beneath the demand curve above the price that consumers pay. Once I compare it to what the consumer surplus used to be like, you can see that my consumer surplus has increased by exactly this amount. Now we can think about the producer surplus as well. Now my producer surplus has also increased relative to what it was before the subsidy was introduced to the market. I'm still taking the area above the supply curve below the price that the producers get, which was PP. If we compare this area to the area of the producer surplus before the subsidy was imposed on the market, you can see that the producer surplus has increased by exactly this amount. Now, a common question here is why did I choose to track the producer surplus from the original supply curve rather than the supply curve with the subsidy. Now the answer is that I can find the producer surplus by using that new supply curve. I would just have to use the price that the suppliers or the producers get from the consumers before they get the subsidy from the government. It will be exactly the same area. I do prefer the original method just because our producer surplus is just tracking the difference between the price that the producer gets and the marginal cost of production. And PP is actually the price that the producer gets in this case. And our supply curve, our original supply curve is actually the marginal cost of production. So I feel like it has a more natural interpretation, but you can use the other supply curve if you like. Now, just concentrating on the areas for which the consumer and the producer surplus has increased, you can actually see that our cost to the government, which was this red triangle, sorry, red rectangle, we can understand this injection of funds by the government into the market as being transferred in part to be an increase in consumer surplus, in part to be an increase in producer surplus. And then there is another bit which hasn't ended up to be anyone's surplus. Now this is actually going to be the area of our deadweight loss. So it's a perfectly legitimate and interesting interpretation of our deadweight loss here to see that the injection of funds by the government into the market has been transferred only in part to the consumers, in part to the producers, and then some of that money has not turned into surplus. So that's an inefficiency in a sense. We can also see that this area counts as dead weight loss because producing any quantity above Q star, which was our original quantity, is going to be inefficient. And if we were going to use this way of isolating dead weight loss, we would just note that the area between Q star and Q prime, the marginal benefit of consumption, so that's how much good that the consumers get from consuming those units, that's actually below the cost of production, the true cost of production. So we're producing where our costs are higher than our benefits. This is really bad for economists if our main problem, our whole entire reason why we're doing economics is because of the question of what we do with our scarce resources. The idea is, well, we better not be producing where our costs are higher than our benefits. So the levels of production here between Q star and Q prime where our costs are higher than our benefits, but the subsidy has distorted the market in such a way that we are still producing them. This is bad and inefficient, and that's why it's dead weight loss. Okay, I hope that helped. Um, please like and subscribe if it did. I hope you guys are having a lovely night.